My name is Paul Malloy, and I'm an alcoholic. Let me just briefly mention what we're going to be covering in today's general session. Initially, we're going to start off with Dr. Gitlow giving us his Addiction 101. Some of you may have seen it before, but if you have not, you're going to learn a whole lot and you're going to have a real treat because this particular psychiatrist uses an old-fashioned way of flip charts and magic markers. And all of us can understand what is meant by that. I sometimes get lost in PowerPoint presentations. I sometimes get lost with texting and all that. But the nice thing about Dr. Gitlow is he keeps us in the here and now and he makes us aware of the past. Because I remember when flip charts were the newest invention around. <laughs> now the second thing we're going to do is after Gitlo, Mr. Dr. Gitlow gives his presentation, we're going to learn who won the elections for World Council. <laughs> Dr. Hoffman and Jane have spent hours, hours, counting those votes. I didn't realize that counting was such an intensive effort and labor until I observed them. What makes it difficult is that in the residence side, there were about seven people campaigning for three jobs. And on the alumni side, there were three people competing for one job. It was easier to count the alumni, but uh, when you start counting who gets the most votes for the residents, difficult job. And of course, the job is even made more difficult because at this successful convention, we had an awful lot of people, a lot of residents, a lot of alumni, and I hope you all had a good time. Now, even more important than you having a good time is that I hope you'll all go back home tomorrow and the next day and carry the message and be inspired to open a lot more Oxford houses. Yeah. You all have every reason to be proud that there are 2,000 500, or 2,653 Oxford Now, I know sometimes that we open them so fast, and so we sometimes put the celebrations behind a little bit. The state of Washington has been telling me all weekend that they're going to have a celebration next weekend for the 300th house in the state of Washington. Yes, 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 the people of Washington State need a cheer, but you should also remind them that they need to keep track. There are now 311 houses in the state of Washington. I realize it's a big state, so it may take them a while to have the word spread, but uh, next week, I think they celebrate 300th Oxford House. That's a good example for all of us in the state of Washington has moved aggressively since 1988, really, to get Oxford Houses in the far Northwest. We hope other states will do the same. The reason that Oxford Houses work so well is that they follow the principles of democracy, which are built into our bone as folks in the United States. Very early on, we figured out that, yeah, people should have a right to vote. You decide issues by vote instead of fists and instead of fighting with each other. And we also decided very early on that you needed checks and balances and you need to have some kind of format to 
stay within the guardrails. And Oxford House, from the very beginning, did that with the Oxford House Manual, the Chapter Manual, the World Council Manual. All of those things contribute to us running what I think is a very professional outfit. And being a professional outfit in and of itself isn't worth much. But being an outfit where every single individual is treated equally and every individual is given an equal chance to succeed at staying clean and sober. And every individual in Oxford House is able to get together once a year here for the annual convention. But most states now also have a state convention and there are regional conventions and there are chapter meetings. And as I have said from the beginning, the purpose of getting clean and sober is gaining self-reliance and self-respect. But it also is to make sure that we have fun. Life has to be worth living. Life has to be fun. If it's not, we go back to our old ways. But I think that this convention week end has been fun and it's going to continue to be fun. And for us to have both fun and education, let me now call on Dr. Gitlow to come and give a presentation on Addiction 101. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. I would love to tell you that my talk today will be exactly the same as it's been previously. But it's not. I'll include some of the highlights. I know some of you are looking forward to some of them. Some of those will be the same. But we've got to start out in a different place. Sex and drugs. <laughs> who, think, who thinks the two are related in some way? All right. And yet, we're in a real different place now than we were if we go back 40, 50 years. So the lecture has to be different. You know, I'm 56. When I hit adolescence somewhere in the 70s, I remember discovering girls. And there was a place I could go to look at girls who weren't wearing any clothes. Playboy. That was it. There wasn't much to it. They had clothes on for the most part. And this was way before shaving was a thing. <laughs> so if they didn't have clothes, you still didn't see very much. <laughs> and, that was, and that was it. And that was all there was until there was somebody real there. Well, that time has long passed. You know, somebody hits 13, 14, no matter what the parents are saying, no matter what kind of parental controls you think you have, you know, you all have been there. You know very well you find ways around that. And if you don't, your friends have, right? So. And think about what's on Pornhub, YouPorn, XNXX, et cetera. <laughs> right? And it's not just a picture of somebody. Now we're getting into some things where you even, you know, we sit there and go, really? <laughs> Why? But there's somebody out there watching those things saying, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is it, right? That guy turns into someone like Jeffrey Epstein. I don't know what happens next. But you sit there and you say to yourself, we're in a world right now where not only is the availability of this sort of thing way over the top, but what people do with it is way over the top. 
And that's what hits the news. That's the whole Me Too movement. It's the whole thing that says what was allowable in the past, even though it wasn't allowable back then, but we were ignoring it in the past. We're not going to ignore it anymore. But how can you be in a world where the two coexist, where we don't ignore it and we get people in trouble for it at the same time as we're exciting them with it? Right? You can't sit there and say, it's all well and good when it's imaginary, but it's not well and good when you do it for real. Well, the whole thing about sexuality is directly connected to drugs. Remember, again, if I go back the 40 years and I say, what drugs were available in my high school? All right, you could find THC with a 4% strength. That was about it. Right? There wasn't much more. We weren't. There was no methamphetamine. There was certainly no powdered heroin of the strength and purity that would allow people to shoot up or snort. So people were staying away from it. Needles were the dividing line. Right? So you wouldn't get a 15-year-old started on heroin because the drug wasn't available in the form. Well, just like sexuality has changed in terms of what's available to people, drugs have changed too. And what's available has changed. And so we can't expect people in their 20s, 30s, 40s to be in the same place that people were in when they were in their 20s, 30s, and 40s 30 years ago. Because they grew up in a different environment. The world has changed and become so stressful, so severe, so in your face, over the top. Whether it's social media driving it, or the computers driving it, or what. This is a different world. And the rules have to change alongside of that. You know, we can't go around doing what used to be OK. Sure, it was fine to you know, have criminal charges around heroin when the people using the heroin were the, you know, the 1% right, of those using drugs, and where that was sort of the high end, and, and people, it wasn't everybody. Now it's everybody. Right? How many people here have known somebody who died as a result of heroin use? Right? It's everybody. All of us are touched. And the wild thing about this is I could take an audience of people not in recovery, not actively using drugs. I could go to virtually any place, get an audience of this size, and say, how many of you know somebody who's been impacted by the heroin crisis? They would all raise their hands, too. That's a change. Right? The world's a different place. And that's why yesterday I, we started to have some of the discussion around Suboxone and some of the discussion around medication-assisted treatment. And I said, you know, just like these aren't your mom and dad's drugs anymore, this isn't your mom and dad's recovery anymore either. This is the sort of place where we've got to say the rules have to change. We have to do things differently than we did five years ago, let alone 40. Right, so we're looking at things a different way. How did this opioid crisis get started anyway? We talked about that very much. Right, where did this come from? Um, came from a few different places if you want to go back a couple of decades. And essentially was a perfect storm. Um, a number of issues came to bear simultaneously, all of which led to it. There's nobody to blame except everybody. Right? Because everybody had a role in it. Um, but let's look at how that started. What are the, the different components of the opioid crisis? And how do we get to this point where we are now? First things first, is there an opioid crisis? Y y yes and no. Yes in that you're all familiar with someone who's died as a result of it. But if I had asked you 20 years ago, are you, how many of you are familiar with somebody who's died as a result of either cigarette smoking or tobacco? You'd all have raised your hands then, too. So we had a crisis then. We have a crisis now. The crisis is addiction. All that's changed is which drug are we talking about? Right? We're still losing 500,000 people a year as a real result of cigarette smoking. We're still losing 80,000 people a year as a result of alcohol. Um, what has changed is the number with respect to opioid overdoses. That's changed. But the overall number, how many people die per year as a result of addictive disease, that really hasn't changed in a few decades. Right? So yes, there's a crisis, and no, there's not a crisis, depending on your perspective. But what about the opiate specifically? Where did that come from? Number one, 
pharmaceutical industry. Pharmaceutical industry came out with a new line of drugs. Different companies came in, coming out with drugs that were long acting. And the drugs that were long acting were meant or were designed in such a way as to be less addictive. Well, let's talk about that for a second. What makes a drug addictive? A drug is more addictive typically when it is absorbed quickly, when it leads to a quick effect, an immediate and sudden change in how you feel. Right? If you take a drug and you know it's going to work four hours from now, is that a drug you're really excited about? No. Although there's alcohol, that takes at least half an hour. There's no real way around that. But how many people have alcohol as their drug of first choice? A few, OK. But it's certainly not the majority anymore. right? Because most of you are looking for something that works more rapidly. All right. So the drug companies came out with these long-acting opiates that were meant not to be addictive. Of course, it didn't take long for somebody to realize you could crush it and snort it and get a lot more than you could with the shorter-acting drugs. But that wasn't the way they were designed, and that's not the way they were FDA approved. So suddenly, there was availability of this high-grade opioid that worked very well, that could be crushed, snorted, injected, and so forth. Doctors simultaneously were being told, this isn't addictive. Who were they told that by? The pharmaceutical industry. All right. So the doctors are sitting there saying, all right, we now have this new opioid. And it's longer acting, less addictive. I can prescribe it to my people who have pain. But at that point in time, doctors knew, I don't want to prescribe a lot of opiates. Why? Because people can get addicted to them. And so they weren't prescribing a lot. But then something else changed. The Joint Commission, the group that certifies hospitals and other facilities, came through and said, we think it's very important in order for your facility to get certification that patients be satisfied. <coughs> All right? Patient has to be happy when they leave your facility. So if a patient comes in and says, Doc, I'm having this terrible pain. The Vicodin works really well for it. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't give you Vicodin. Oh, I'm not satisfied. All right. Well, how about if I give you the Vicodin? Then I'm very satisfied. <laughs> and they'd get the Vicodin. And they'd leave being very satisfied. And the hospital would get a gold star. Right? And so would the doctor. And so the doctors came about learning, OK, I need to satisfy the patients. This is the only thing that seems to satisfy them. Whose fault is it at that point? Well, it's sort of the patients for coming in and demanding this drug that they really didn't need. It's the doctor for buying into this whole scheme that didn't make much sense. It's the pharmaceutical industry's fault for having this drug in the first place. It's for everybody's fault. Everyone's participating in this so far. What else led to it? Well, the pain committees, the groups responsible for treatment of chronic pain, said to doctors, you're under-treating pain. Pain should be looked at as a vital sign. Take the blood pressure. Take the person's pulse. Find out their temperature and ask them how much pain they have. So the doctor said, all right, we're under-treating pain. We need to treat pain more. What do we have to treat pain? Not very much. Never mind the fact that there's been no medical literature ever to say that opioids work as a treatment for chronic pain. Isn't that amazing, right? We're in the middle of the opioid crisis because pain was being overtreated with opiates, despite the fact that there's not a single article out there saying to doctors, you should prescribe opiates for pain. Not one. <coughs> opioids are meant to be used for cancer-related pain or acute pain, not for chronic non-cancer-related pain, ever. Because nine times out of 10, you'll end up with something called hyperalgesia, which means you will experience gradually increasing levels of pain, requiring greater and greater amounts of opioids to cope with, ultimately leading to the fact that you're taking these ridiculous doses of opioids, which you then need in order to feel better from the hyper-awareness of pain that you wouldn't have had if you had never been started on the opiate in the first place. All right. So the pain committees are telling the doctors you need to treat pain more. 
The pharmaceutical companies has made this drug readily available. The Joint Commission is telling the hospital to encourage the patients be satisfied. At about the same time as all of that happened, the federal government starts to close down pill mills. And when they close down pill mills, which is a fine thing, the patients end up sitting there who were getting ridiculously high doses of opiates to cope with the pain that they had as a result of having been on the opiates for such a long time. And they say, what do we do? Well, they would go to the street to buy opiates. And they would find plenty of opiates there, except the opiates came from the overprescribing, largely from the pill mills, which were now being shut down. So just as the patients got out there on the street, their supply was cut off. And they said, well, can I go see the addiction doc and get detox? No, there aren't enough of us. And we had a limit. We could only give medication-assisted treatment, which works really well in these kind of situations, to a limited number of people. If we're going to have an epidemic of diabetes, do we go to the endocrinologists and say, you can only treat 30 people with diabetes? Are you kidding me? That's ridiculous. So we were sitting there as addiction docs with our hands tied. We could not treat the number of people who were suddenly on the street looking for opiates because their supply had been shut off. So we couldn't treat them. And they couldn't get the drugs on the street because that supply was being limited as well. At the same time, the United States became a net exporter of marijuana because we grow very good marijuana in the United States. <laughs> We had been importing it from Mexico. Now we were not, because our pot's better than their pot. <laughs> so we send them our pot. Well, what, is all the, what are all the people who were sending us weed from Mexico going to use as their way of making money? Heroin, right? And the timing was perfect. They sent us pure, high-grade, powdered heroin that could be snorted or injected right, so that kids could use it. Didn't have to be put in a needle. Could be used in other ways. And all these folks who were on the street as a result of all the aforementioned events now found themselves in a position where, oh, there's heroin available, and it's cheap. You can make it even cheaper if you add fentanyl, but that's later. Right. So now all of a sudden, here's the drug. It's readily available. It solves the problem momentarily. And that's where we're at right now. We are in a position that we made ourselves. Now, is there a way through this? Of course there is. You know, we could start every single person who's been caught up in this on medication-assisted treatment for at least a short period of time, if not longer, but at least a short period of time to get them through the cravings, the withdrawal, and so forth, and then into recovery. And those who came at this because they had true addictive disease, they'll go through what all of you went through. Those who came at this because they were just misprescribed a drug, they'll find it easier. But either which way they need to be treated, the percentage of people who need medication-assisted treatment for opioid-related disease is fewer than 10% of the population that needs it. The availability still isn't at the level it needs to be. So if we're going to address this crisis, we need to do so quickly and in a targeted manner and get it done and at least get us back to where we were to begin with, which was no great place. It was the place where 10 to 15% of the population has addictive disease. Part of this requires changing the paradigm of what is addictive disease, because too many people think that the paradigm is about drug use. Right? When I talk about addictive disease, I am not talking about drug use. Right? A lot of times people come in, they, they ask doctors, they give us surveys. And one of the surveys that I get pretty frequently is a survey that says, what percentage of your patients who use opiates are taking prescription opiates? versus what percentage is taking heroin. And my result is, I don't know, and I don't care. 
it makes absolutely no difference. They're the same, right? One could be mixed with fentanyl, sure, but so you can crush the others and mix that with fentanyl too. I mean, you know, they're the same. They do the same thing. The only reason why heroin is looked at any differently than all of the other full agonist opiates, all the other opiates that work the same way, it dates back to a, a law that was passed in the very early 20th century. It has nothing to do with science. There's no major difference between uh, what's in Percocet or Vicodin and, and heroin. They work the same way. They do the same things. They'll get you in just as much trouble or not. Um, so the differences don't really matter when you come right down to it. What does matter is what class of drug you're interested in using, and that matters from the perspective of how we're going to treat you. But it, truth be told, addictive disease is not about the drugs. Now here's where this argument keeps popping up. It's not an argument we'll hear often in a room like this. It is an argument you'll hear in rooms full of doctors. I'm a psychiatrist by training. Psychiatrists are, um, are trained that addictive disease is divided into different segments. There's a sedative use disorder, there's an alcohol use disorder, cocaine use disorder, and so forth. These are all, according to the psychiatry manual, different disease states. So it's really interesting, right? You can, you can take um, a, a Valium, and uh, if somebody is having difficulty where they're using Valium 30, 40, 50 milligrams a day, and they're diagnosed with a sedative use disorder, and then they stop using Valium and they switch to Budweiser, their sedative use disorder is now gone, right? Really? Their disease that they were diagnosed with is gone? Are you kidding? They're the same. They work the same way. So in the field of addiction medicine, which is another specialty competing in some ways, perhaps with psychiatry, um, in addiction medicine, there's one disease, addiction. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about Valium or alcohol or cocaine or opiates or sex, for that matter, or gambling. It's all the same thing. It's all based on the same thing. The outcome's the same. The rush the person feels, the desire to do something that the person knows will get him or her in trouble, the continued experience of acting out in a way that will make you feel great for the moment and then will dissipate and then will end up leaving you in harm's way. Right? Because otherwise, I need to have some explanation as to how these diseases differ from one another. So I'm sitting around, I'm sitting around looking at an audience like this and saying, at some point, were you at a point in your life where you had lost all your money, your family, the people who cared about you, a car that worked, and your job? How many people were at that point, some point? Right? Right. So you lost everything that was important to you. Right? And you sit there and you say, let, let me ask another question. Did any of you want that? Raise your hand if you wanted that. That's what you were looking for. Yeah, a couple, right? But for the most part, that wasn't what you were seeking. Right? So, and yet, did you know, at least in the back of your mind, where it was taking you? You knew it was going there. But you couldn't stop, right? This isn't about a desire, but most people think this is a desire, where you have a choice. It has nothing to do with choice. I've always likened addictive disease and the use of something as being the same as if I take a, a group of individuals and lock them in a room with a, a banquet of food in front of them. And I say, you know, I come in and I've got some rat poison and I spray the food. And I say, I've just sprayed this with rat poison. If you eat the food, you'll die pretty instantaneously. It'll be a horrible death. Don't eat the food. And then I leave, but I lock the doors. There will be a point as time passes where they're going to eat the food. Right? If I leave them in long enough, they'll eat the food. One of them will get up first and will come over and say, you know, I think the spray missed over at this end. I'm going to start here. She takes the food instantly, passes out, and dies. Right? And you say to yourself, well, now that it's been proven that if you eat the food and you die, no one else will eat the food. No, no. 
Now, second person's not far behind. You know, and of course, that makes sense because you get so hungry, the hunger drives you to do this thing you know is going to kill you. I look at folks who know where they've bought their drug from and they've seen the urine drug test showing there's fentanyl mixed in, and they've seen that a friend who bought from the same place died as a result of it, still go back to the same place and buy it again. You've heard of that, right? That's the same thing. So if someone's willing to do that, there must be something driving them that goes beyond the ordinary. But it's not beyond the ordinary. It's exactly what a person locked in a room who's hungry will eventually do, except you're there at the beginning. Right? I close the door, and you immediately come up to the food. You don't even wait. Right? What is it that makes addictive disease a disease where you won't wait? And that's what it's all about. So it doesn't have anything to do with the drugs. Nothing. It has to do with how you feel when there are no drugs, how you feel normally in your own skin. That's addictive disease. That is what makes everybody in this room different from everybody else. Not the drugs, not the drug history, not the fact that you, your life was a mess at some point, but how you feel. All right, so let's start there. Now we go to the regular lecture. We have to start out at the point of recognizing that people differ from one another, that everybody is different, that you, if you take a whole population and scatter it about and measure them in some way, that they'll all fall on a curve. And the curve always looks like that, right? Where half the population is above, half the population is below, and you're all scattered under this hill. And as you're scattered under this hill, we could do this. We could measure how tall everybody in the room is. And some people would be up here. I'd be down there. And everybody else would be you know, somewhere in the middle. right? And we could do this with IQ. We could do this with heart rate. We could do it with blood pressure. However we do it, we're going to measure it, and it's going to be like this. One way that we can do it is by measuring the degree to which your brain responds to external stimulation. Right? And one way of measuring that is through something that people have called stimulus augmentation or reduction. Here's what this means. Let's say I take a group of people and I expose them to a certain sound level, a certain volume, a certain level of the, the um, of a single note, and then I turn it off, and I bring them back in five minutes later. I say, I want you to set the volume to where you think it was when you were previously exposed to it. Some people will set it much higher than it was originally. They thought it was much louder than it really was. Some people will set it much lower. People look at it in a different way. They experience it in a different way. You've all had that happen. You've gone to the movies with somebody or to a club with somebody, and somebody says, oh, why do they have to have the volume up so loud? And somebody else is going, oh, I think it's just fine. You know, in fact, it could be a little louder. That would be great. Yeah. You know? So you go outside today. A lot of you probably went out for lunch, maybe took a little walk. It's bright out there. How many of you, if you were going to say walk down to the mall and back on a day like today, bright, sunny, blue sky day, how many of you would have worn sunglasses to do that walk? How many of you would not wear sunglasses to do the walk? And you see, we got about 50-50, right? Half of you were up here. You'd wear the sunglasses, right? And we'll call you sun positive. Half of you are down here. You would not wear the sunglasses. You'd be sun negative. Those of you who wore the sunglasses were essentially using a drug to adjust your conditions, right? A safe drug, not going to have any withdrawal, not going to have any intoxication. It's totally OK. But you were adjusting your experience using an external device. Why were you doing that? 
You were doing that because the world felt bright, irritating, annoying. And I'm willing to bet that those of you who absolutely have the sunglasses, who you know have them on top of your head now, <laughs> those of you out there are stimulus augmenters. You often feel as if the world is overly stimulating, annoying, distressing. You wish the volume would just get turned down. You wish the kids would stop yelling. You wish the guy across the street would quit mowing his lawn. <laughs> and the dog would quit barking. And people would just get away, just stop. Right? That's a stimulus augmenter. Stimulus augmenter tends to like sedatives, something that'll turn the volume down. They feel as if. Everything's just right when they can turn the volume down. Then down here, we have the folks who don't even own sunglasses. <laughs> World's a really quiet, mostly dull place. They're the ones who love going 90 in the left lane because everybody else is just going too slow. And you wouldn't mind hang gliding or skydiving or rock climbing or motorcycling. Because something's got to turn the volume up a little bit. You want a loud club. Well, these are the folks for whom you know, methamphetamine, cocaine, right? Does the sunglass example work? Yeah. So for the most part, it does. Because for the most part, it's pretty easy to divide people up and see what they're like and what they like and appreciate. But of course, I can do this. This is kind of a parlor trick, right? I can do this with any population of people. It doesn't have to be addicts, but let's go on. Let's look at something else. Let's say that I want to know how drugs work. For how drugs work, we have to look at a timeline. It's over here on the horizontal line is time. And on the vertical line, we're going to use our zero point, our baseline, that's our starting point. And we're just going to say zero. And then as drugs work, they usually do things to you. They may make you a little sedated. You might be a little disinhibited doing things you wouldn't ordinarily do. Here you're sleepy. Here you're asleep. There you're dead. And <laughs> right, direct result and the straight order of things as the brain becomes increasingly depressed. If you throw up right about there and get rid of what you took, then you don't die. If you don't throw up, right, it's an alcohol anyway, um, well, then if you drink enough, you go down there. Um, and similarly, um, up here, you're a little nervous, a little anxious, uh, kind of bouncing around a bit, really uncomfortable, jittery, sweating. Um, and somewhere in here, you have a grand mal seizure. If I give you a sedative drug, and the sedative drug I'll use here for the, state, for the sake of example, because it's been the best studied, is alcohol. But for alcohol, I can use all the equivalents. I can look at Valium, Librium, Ativan, Clonopin, Xanax. They're all the same, right? These are just really dry martinis. Um, I can. <laughs> I can look at the Z drugs, so-called Z drugs, because of what their generic names are, but their brand names are Sonata, Ambien, and Lunesta, all the same. I can look at Soma, the muscle relaxant. I can look at um, chloral hydrate. Uh, I can look at any one of these drugs. They all work identically. As far as the brain's concerned, they are the same drug. Right? For those of you, I'm sure none of you have ever seen this, but if, you know, have you ever heard of a doctor who would give somebody clonopin during the day and, and, and uh, Lunesta or Ambien in the evening? Right? I, I know none of you have ever seen that. Um, that would be because it, it would be a ridiculous thing, right? You're giving them, it's like giving people a bud during the day and a cores in the evening. It, it, it's sort of stupid. Um, you don't mix them. And then, to, to, you know, just to beat all, some doctors out there, and, and I, I hope none of you have ever seen this, would give the, the clonopin during the day and the ambient at night, and then somewhere along the way an Adderall as well. <laughs> right? No one would ever do that because that makes no sense. Um, you know, why would you give somebody something that, that lifts you up and knocks you down simultaneously? Uh, you, well, of course, there are speed balls. All right, I'm getting, getting off the topic. All right. So, 
So let's look just at, at alcohol and how it works. So alcohol, when you drink it, you experience a period that lasts about two hours long of sedation. The amplitude of this curve, the depth of the curve, is dependent upon how much alcohol I drink, not upon um, you know, the time period, right? So the amplitude, this amount, the amount of sedation you experience is based upon how much you drink. The two hour period, that's the same, independent of the amount. I can have a little bit, I can have a lot. It's gonna last two hours, right? It may peak at a different point, right? If I drink a whole fifth of vodka all at once and I've had nothing to eat and I weigh you know, 100 pounds, then yeah, I, I might end up dead as a result, okay? If I just drink a little tiny bit, I don't notice it, but it still lasts two hours and it's measurable, okay. What do most people do when they drink? If you know how to drink, you, sp you space your drinks apart, right? And you space your drinks apart by, well, you want to get to a certain level first. Then you space them apart thereafter. <laughs> so, so if you want to space them apart just right, you're going to be drinking about the same amount steadily each hour. And that way, you maintain an identical level of sedation over an extended period of time. You know you can't have all the beer you want to have in an evening at once, or it doesn't work. But if you space the beers out, then it works well to maintain whatever the level is that you want to maintain over the course of the evening. But there's a part you don't count on, which is that each time this sedation wears off, the brain is in the position where the brain is saying to the body, what I mean for us to be doing is to be standing right here, exactly like this. And you just took a drug that made us go like that. I don't like that. And so I'm going to try and change the way I'm regulated so that we go back this way. The brain does that slowly over a period of time. And the alcohol wears off over that same period of time. And the brain overshoots. And so you end up over here. Then the brain says, eh, I don't mean to be here either. Now let's push you back toward the center. That takes a little while to do. And that leads to a different curve that looks like that. All right? So this is curve A here. That's curve B. Curve B is a lower amplitude. It's not as strong as the first one because it lasts longer, because the brain is rather slow at making these adjustments. So the first thing that happens when you drink alcohol is you feel sedated, disinhibited, calmed. The second thing that happens when that wears off is you get a little jittery, headache, discomfort, right? The light's too bright. It's annoying, right? You're back where you started from, but worse than that. And that's the hangover, all right? Now, if you drank just enough to notice something, you don't notice the curve B, right? You have to experience the sedation in order to experience the agitation that comes afterward. The best way to experience the agitation is to experience the sedation over an extended period of time, like this guy did. Right? He had four drinks, each one spaced an hour apart so that he could maintain his level of sedation way below where he normally is. And as a result, he gets four different B curves. And what happens there is the A's don't add up to each other because he said, I want to maintain the level of sedation. I know very well I can have a drink every hour in order to do that. But to maintain the level of agitation, you would have to drink only every three hours, but you spaced them more closely than that. So the agitations build up on each other to the point that the next morning, there it is, four in the morning, you're finally in bed, you finally get to sleep, and there you are. <laughs> and you can't do it. Why can't you do it? Because you're here. And you're there saying to yourself, I wasn't that drunk last night. I shouldn't have this kind of issue. No, you weren't that drunk. 
but you were mildly intoxicated for an extended period of time. Now imagine the person who does this every day. Most of what they feel, most of their waking hours is this. They don't go back to where they started. They never give themselves a chance. They're here. They're grossly uncomfortable. You all know what will make this person feel better right now, right? Drink. Brings you right back down. But just for a couple hours, then you're going to be back up and even higher than you were to begin with. All right. So you've got these per people with grave levels of discomfort the majority of the time. Right here. That's where they're living. Instead of living here, where they originally were living. So if you're living in the wrong place, then think to yourself, that, remember, everything I just said here, none of this is about addictive disease. This is just pharmacology of sedatives. It applies to 100% of the mammalian population, right? Giraffes, bats, people, whatever, all the same. All right, <laughs> take these folks. They come back, and they do it again and again and again, despite anything that might have happened along the way. This is addictive disease. The repeating process, the saying, no matter how uncomfortable it was, next time it'll be better. Next time it'll be different. I'll do it differently. I won't drink before noon. I won't drink this kind of thing. I won't drink in that sort of way. I won't drink in this and such a manner. Right? One of the best ways to diagnose addictive disease, you know, it's funny, they, 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 they teach new physicians all kinds of techniques to go through. There's a really easy way. All I need is for a patient to come in and say, yeah, doc, I don't have addiction because uh, yeah, I, I only drink, uh, you know, I make sure to limit my drinks to two. OK, you have addictive disease. We're all done here. <laughs> because nobody who doesn't have addictive disease needs to limit their drinks. Right? right? Does somebody come in and say, I limit the orange juice I have to only two glasses with my cereal? No. If anybody said that, I'd know they have a real problem with orange juice. No one has ever said that to me. <laughs> so I look back at this and I say, this is interesting. Now let's take the first curve, the sunglass curve, and turn it on its side. All right? All of you who said, got to wear the sunglasses when I'm outside, you're starting out here. You are uncomfortable to begin with. For you, turning the volume down would be great. You're uncomfortable. Not ridiculously so. You can get through a day. You can do it. But you're uncomfortable. And the sunglasses turn things down. Alcohol works great. You have a glass of beer and, or a can of beer, and, and you're all set. Makes you feel better. For the average person in the community, a can of beer makes them feel different, not better, different. And for the people who are down here, those of you who said you're stimulus reducers, you don't even own sunglasses, the stimulants of the drugs you like, if you have a drug like alcohol, how does that make you feel worse, typically? Right? Uncomfortable, nauseated, sick to your stomach. It's not a good feeling. So if you start out down here, you don't like it. Well, now imagine you're up here. And you say to yourself, as most people who have addictive disease say, the very first time I tried X, I felt the way I think everybody else feels all the time. You're right. You're absolutely right. That's the disease. The fact is, you discovered the very first time you used that you felt better. And you were right. You did felt, feel better. You went back to exactly where it was if you were stimulant and you started down here and go up. Same thing. And you suddenly discovered this is the way everybody else feels, usually. Yep, absolutely right. Problem is, you discovered it with a drug that has some side effects. And the side effects last longer than the effects. 
And so what happens is you do this, and then you go up here. And now, if you were uncomfortable to begin with, now you're up there, and you're damned uncomfortable. Well, this is a place where you can kind of go either way. You know the alcohol will make you feel better. You know the drug will make you feel better. But you don't need to do it. But up here, that's a different story. You need to do it. It's as if you were in that room with the food up here that you knew was poisonous, but you were so hungry and the hunger was driving you and you said, my God, I'm sure there's some place in that food where the food doesn't have the poison sprayed in it. And that's where you are after you've used the drug for the first time, but not before. Before, you're just sitting there uncomfortable. So it takes three things in order to make somebody with addictive disease. The first thing it takes is that there's something that is causing you discomfort in the first place before you've ever been exposed to a drug. Something that makes you feel less than. Something that makes you feel like you're just not experiencing the world the way everybody else is. But then there's a second part, because remember, if I went out to the population that does not have addictive disease and I asked them about sunglasses or not, I'll find the same range. Right? There are a lot of folks out in the world who have stimulus augmentation and stimulus reduction and don't use drugs. They never discovered them. Or they discovered them and said, eh, not for me. Right? What's the difference? What is it that, that adds up to this? And for that, we have to talk about the fact that there is a contributing factor from genetics and a contributing factor from the environment. The genetics is this part, the part that says, here's how you feel at your baseline. Here's how you feel ordinarily. That's genetics. The environmental piece can be a little bit difficult. I apologize to those of you who heard this story before. It's still a good story, though, so I'll use the same one. Five-year-old kid's playing baseball for the first time. He goes out with his friends. He doesn't know how to play baseball. His friends know that, so they stick him in right field. Nothing happens in right field, right? especially when you're five and the other kid's playing are six. Ball's never going to get there. And so the kid's out there. He's getting sunburned. He's counted the four-leaf clover. He's watched the airplanes. He's named every cloud that he's seen. And then he sees a shadow, and he hears a thunk. Well, there's the ball. Ball's way too big for his hand. He has no idea what to do with it or where it should go. And he looks up. Everybody's yelling at him because the ball's been there for you know, like 10 seconds, and he hasn't done anything yet. So he lifts up the ball. And he's got to throw it somewhere. And he sees some kid running. He says, oh, I'll throw it at the running kid. <laughs> Everybody makes fun of him for not knowing how to play baseball. He goes home, he looks at his old man's dad, everybody made fun of me. I feel like a, the, an idiot. I, I couldn't, couldn't possibly get out of my own way any better. I'm embarrassed, I'm ashamed, whatever it is he tells his old man. His dad looks at him and says, yeah, I think that exact same thing happened to me too. Let's get some ice cream. Then I'll take you out back and I'll show you how to play baseball so that you never get embarrassed like this again. Or he looks at him and says, well, gosh darn, Tommy, you pretty much suck at everything you do, don't you? Right? How many of you have had that dad, second dad? Right? And second dad is the dad who just taught Tommy something. What he taught Tommy is, when I feel uncomfortable and ashamed and embarrassed and less than, and I share my feelings with someone who's supposed to give a damn, I will end up feeling worse. <laughs> and so Tommy just learned not to do that, not to share his feelings, not to share intimately with other people. With girls, the story's usually a little different. You got molested in some way by stepbrother, stepdad, uncle, whatever. You go to mom, you tell her, mom hits you and says, never talk about that again. Or mom doesn't believe you, calls you a liar. Or mom says, yeah, that happens to all of us, but there's no other way we're going to keep a roof over our head. We just have to tolerate it. Suck it up, right? You don't want to be like mom. So you grow up feeling less than, traumatized, right? In some way, this trauma stays with you, right? 
It's a tough question to answer. How many people have ever experienced something they would consider traumatizing in childhood, right? It's pretty much the whole room, right? That's routine for this disease. Something has to happen to trigger the genetic component so that you end up saying to yourself, the drugs make me feel better, nothing else does. Ordinary people, non-addicts, would typically say, drugs make me feel better, but so do a lot of other things. Therefore, I don't want to go down the road where I go to jail and I lose all my money and my home and my job and my family. Right? I'll simply do the road of talking to people. But I look at my folks, remember, any other chronic disease, if I had patients with diabetes, right, a life-threatening chronic disease that's eventually going to kill them, and I say to them, I can make it so that you can eat a normal diet, you can live a normal life, you're not going to have your toes falling off, you're not going to lose your eyesight, all you need to do is go into a room full of people who are other di diabetics, say, hi, my name's Stu, I'm a diabetic, and let me explain you know, what I went through last week, the difficulties I had with my insulin pump, or whatever it is. Right? Well, they would jump up, they'd hug me, and they'd run to the next Diabetics Anonymous meeting. But I have my group of alcoholics who come in for the first time, or, or addicts who come in for the first time, and I say to them, listen, I can make it so that you could have money in your pocket, and your car will actually run, and you'll, be, you'll have a job and a place to live, and people who love and care about you. All you need to do is go into a room full of people just like you who have experienced the same sort of thing you did your whole childhood, growing up, your whole life, and share with them what you've gone through. Well, if they jump up and run off to the next AA meeting, I made a misdiagnosis. <laughs> no one wants to do that, not if you've had this background, because you are certain that if you go into a room and share your feelings with people, a lot of people, let alone one person, that you're going to end up feeling worse, because that's always what happened to you before. It's been proven to you since you were five. That's a tough thing to get over, right? So the big part of addictive disease in terms of how we get through it is to get reparented, right? What's Oxford House but being reparented, right? People who are consistent. So doesn't mean they're your best friend. It means they're there for you like your parents are there for you, responsibly, consistently, appropriately. Right? That's what the job is. And with that, you can get back to baseline, but with the recognition that baseline is not all better because the genes are still there. You are back to the point where you started. You're uncomfortable. Right? That's the baseline point that you've got, where the world is overpowering, overwhelming in some way, and you'd like to adjust it. How do you adjust it when you're in recovery? Well, one way of adjusting it is to use the coping mechanism as much as you can of talking with other people, of sharing with other people, of being there with other people, and using that skill as other people do, but remember, you're always going to know, it's always going to be in the back of your mind that there's a drug out there that will make me feel much better right now. Only problem is it'll destroy my life in the meantime and take me right back to that old path very quickly. I had a patient um, airline pilot who got into trouble overseas and um, uh, went through the appropriate program as necessary under uh, the federal regulations for airline pilots, and got himself cleaned up, went to a 28-day rehab, worked the program, went to AA every day, did everything he was supposed to do for a full five years. Five years sober, five years recovery. The FAA finally said to him, all right, you're good to go. You may return to normal duties and, and you know, all set. When you know, the next week, he's in jail after a bar brawl. And he came back in my office. I said, what happened? He said, well, I never really believed you. you know, I, I knew I had to jump over the fence, uh, jump over the hurdles that you'd set up for me. And I did all that, because I'm good at all that. But I never honestly believed that I had something wrong with me. You know, well, how do you make somebody believe? 
How do you turn non-believers into believers when it's been pressured into them their whole life? You know, how all of this works. Anyway, I talked about how it takes three things to make somebody with addictive disease. One thing is you're born feeling a little uncomfortable. Two is you grow up with the living system with the parents and so forth that make you feel less than, that make you feel as if there's no way of coping with the discomfort. The third is you've got to grow up in a certain society, a society that promotes the use of substances, a society that says, here's what you're supposed to do when you turn 21. Here's what you're supposed to do at a wedding or a funeral or a wake or an anniversary or tailgating with your friends at a sports event or pretty much all the time, anytime. Here's what you're supposed to do. Apparently, we're supposed to change how we feel at those times. Right? That's what every TV show says. Anybody ever watch Grey's Anatomy or Scandal or any of those Thursday? Right. I mean, they drink all the time, right? More so than in real life, product placement at its best. And you sit there and say to yourself, why is it you know, we, we live in that kind of society? It's interesting. We have sort of a, a rule in our society that the goal is always take care of the minority. Right? We do that with seatbelts, right? We have a seatbelt law in every single state. The seatbelt law is there to protect the minority who would otherwise have been at some point in their life thrown through a windshield. Most of you won't end up getting thrown through a windshield. I'll tell you that right now. If none of you wear your seatbelts ever. Most of you will end up OK. But a few of you wouldn't. In order to protect the few of you who wouldn't, all of us are willing to wear our seatbelts. That way, nobody ends up going through the windshield. Right? That's the way our society is set up for everything except drugs. With drugs, let's face it, most people can drink. Most people can even use marijuana. Most people can take opiates as prescribed. But a percentage cannot. Percentage cannot take those drugs without you know, going off on the, on the racetrack here. In order to protect the minority, the 10 to 15% of the population whose lives end up destroyed, shouldn't the other 85% be willing to say, the hell with it? Okay. But, but no one knows you all exist. Right? It's in the back of their minds, even in the midst of a crisis, in part because of the anonymity. Right? And one of the things that I'm beginning to sort of toy with in my mind is the idea as to whether or not it's time to break the anonymity. Come on. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. Is it time for us to stand up as a group and say, now nah, y'all need to listen to us now? Yeah. Um, because we're going down a path, just like the pornography I talked about earlier, where things progress very rapidly to a group of people who really can't make the decisions properly for themselves. And unless we want the next generation to be in even worse shape than we've been, um, we've got to make some changes. And we can't make changes if no one hears us. Right? So it's interesting. You know, Breast cancer is out there with its pink ribbon. Everybody knows about the pink ribbon. I remember when I was a kid, you wouldn't talk about cancer. Doctors were even trained in how to not tell patients that they had cancer right? so that they could just get treated and not have the anxiety of knowing you know, that they might be dying. Right? And you know, times have changed quite a bit. But we have no special color ribbon. There's no walk for addiction. There's not to the extent that we've got it in other areas. We need to sort of modify the paradigm and change things so that our culture stops being one that says that every single event has to be demarcated in some way with use of a mind-altering substance. Because if we didn't have that, if there were no drugs, then what we'd have is a group of people who would be a little uncomfortable and who wouldn't quite know how to feel better about it 
but we could work on that. That would be pretty easy, right? If you came in feeling uncomfortable, but you still had money and a job and a family and at least some people who cared about you, wouldn't that be a better place to start than where we've had a start? Right? So that's the goal is how to get there. But I think Oxford House certainly goes a long way to putting you back in the place that you need to be. Hopefully this has done something for those of you who haven't heard me before to sort of open the door to the different aspects of how to think about addictive disease. And remember, one of the reasons why medication-assisted treatment, going back to opiates for a second, one of the reasons why we look at that is that when we talk about the fact that there are these three separate re reasons, three separate causes for addictive disease, we have to remember we can address all three of them. The trauma, the childhood part, we address with 12-step and with groups. The genetic component we haven't been able to deal with to date, but drugs like Suboxone start to be able to look at addressing that particular aspect of it. It's incomplete but it is one aspect of it. The third aspect is public policy. You know, talking to your congressperson, talking to your senator, talking to your, your state legislature and so forth. And the state legislatures have got to get out of the business of being medical doctors, right? There, there is, and, and I'll, I'll sort of end with this section, there's no such thing as medical marijuana. None. No such thing. If, if there were medical marijuana, there would be a plant that would have been you know, turned into a pill. It would have been FDA approved. It would have been shown to have efficacy for treatment of something. And we'd all be out there taking that for whatever it is we need. But there is no such thing. What there is are some components in the cannabis plant that are useful when broken down, when synthesized down, for a couple of extremely rare conditions, right? Not conditions that anybody in this room is likely to have, or anybody in any room with this number of people in it. I need way more people, and then maybe there's one person in there who might do, do well for it. So it's no surprise when I look at my own state, Rhode Island, and I see who's got the medical marijuana cards. It's not people who the insurance data demonstrate as having had a long history of some chronic illness. It's typically a group of 30-year-olds with no prior medical history except perhaps identified addictive disease <laughs> who are coming in saying that they have pain or a hangnail or halitosis or something <laughs> for which they need this, only this not something that's been actually demonstrated to work, like a different shampoo. Um, you know, it, it just it doesn't make sense. But we've got legislatures out there who are thinking to themselves in the different states that they went to medical school somewhere along the way, and they didn't. So they've called it medical marijuana, but you won't find anybody in the actual medical industry who's called it that because there's no such thing. We've got legislated marijuana. And unfortunately, this is contributing to the country's belief system that intoxicants, things that change how you feel, are OK. Because indeed, they are OK for a majority. But there's a very significant minority for whom they are not. And it's for that minority that the rest of the country ought to be able to give it up. Yeah. And that's what we need to start asking for. Thanks very much. Good seeing you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. You bet. Anytime. Dr. Gitlow, thank you very, very much. Let's give him another hand.
Jackson, are you around? Uh, I think you had a couple of announcements you wanted to make, so head up this direction. While Jackson is uh, heading up this direction, uh, let me uh, remind everybody that the banquet is this evening. We look forward to uh, not only good food and good company, but also uh, a good speaker. Uh, from Tennessee, they tell me. Sort of from Tennessee. Maybe you could say from Oregon, or Louisiana, or a few other places. In other words, our speaker's been around. Jackson. Give us a, your message and we'll uh, then pick up our meeting here. Thank you, Paul. So tonight, after we break in this session, everybody's gonna go upstairs, get all dressed up. Please, please be patient with the elevators and give yourself enough time to get down for the banquet. Just be mindful of the time with the elevators. We're probably gonna end up having a line pretty long line coming around. You have to have your banquet ticket to get into this room. If you do not have a bank, I'm, I'm getting to that. <laughs> if you do not have a banquet ticket where breakfast was and t-shirts are, we will have tables set up there. You will be fed the same meal and there will be a screen with a live feed of the stage of the podium for tonight's activities. So you will still get to participate in everything. You just won't get to see it live and in person. It'll be through a live video feed. So if you do not have a ticket, there will be the Renaissance seating you for dinner there. Now, everybody, we want to enjoy tonight's festivities after the dinner. Across the way, we're gonna have a dance. It's gonna be where the breakouts were across the way. We have, for the first time, we've doubled the size of our stage. We've gone to 40 foot by 40 feet. So. And we have a step and repeat. We have a professional photographer. Those will be set up before the banquet. So when you are dressed up, instead of waiting in line for 30 minutes, you can go and get a picture in front of the step and repeat and the professional photographer. Last thing, please, very important. If you have the app, you can now take the evaluation survey through the app. Very easy electronic survey. If you want to do it on paper, we're going to have some surveys available throughout at the registration table and at the table down in the corner. And don't forget to buy your raffle tickets. We're gonna draw at the dance for the big prizes. Your last chance to buy tickets is gonna be before the banquet. And when you smoke, make sure you put your cigarette butts out and put them in the ashtray so we don't start any fires. If you, need CU, <clears throat> if you need forms for CE credits, we will have the forms that you need to fill out out there as well. C evaluations? Oh yes, if you complete a paper evaluation, you will get a ticket. If you show the, the people uh, handing out the paper evaluations that you've completed the evaluation on your app, you will get a ticket. This ticket could win you an iPad at the dance. Thank you, uh, Jackson. Let me uh, mention a couple of things. Uh, as you all know, next year's convention is going to be in Seattle at a brand new Hyatt. And then the year after that, we'll be back to this area at the Gaylord, which is uh, on the river and right across from Alexandria with water taxis and all kinds of other stuff. One of the things that's happened to us is we have grown. And as we have grown, our choices become more select. So this year, when we get to resolutions and so on, we're not going to be voting at this convention on when the 20, 
23 convention will be. 22. Yes, 22. But instead, what we will do is at our next convention in Seattle, we will vote on that. For areas that are interested in hosting the convention, let me suggest a game plan. The game plan should be to send in proposals to the central office, the Silver Spring crowd, OHI. And the reason that you send those in is that OHI is building up some expertise within OHI to figure out the specifics of what is out there. For example, if you suggest Nashville, and somebody else suggests uh, Dallas, and somebody else suggests Louisville, <laughs> uh, each of those jurisdictions will require somebody to figure out, has a hotel got enough room? Are there airlines that can get us there at a reasonable cost? All that kind of stuff. And we will figure out a scheme to say, here are the five cities that have been nominated when, once we're in Seattle. And each of those cities has been evaluated by our convention team. <laughs> and the convention team has put a five on this one, a four on this one, a three on this one. And then they'll explain what these numbers mean. In some cases, for example, we may have a benefit in a certain place of very low hotel rooms, low price hotel rooms. Some other place, it may be that the town or city has great airline fares. But those are the kinds of things that we would need to consider. In order for there to be proper consideration, I would suggest that if any area wants to get that convention in their town or their city, by the end of this calendar year, by New Year's Day, <laughs> you need to send the stuff in to OHI, Silver Spring. And then OHI will get some word back to you if they have further questions or if they have looked at it and said, you know, nobody wants to go to Lawrence, Kansas. I'm sure lots of students at the University of Kansas like to go to Lawrence, Kansas, but the rest of us, yeah, maybe Wichita. Yeah. <laughs> maybe Kansas City. Yeah. But in, in any event, the procedure I'm suggesting, and I hope you will all follow, any areas that are interested, get the material in to OHI by the end of this year. OHI will then get back to you by mid-March, and we'll have all that information ahead of time so when we gather together in Seattle, we'll be able to argue with each other, people can make presentations, we can decide where the hell are we going to go in 2022. Okay? That bit of housekeeping. The next thing that I want to do is to uh, let everybody know who won the World Council elections. And then we will get the new and the old World Council folks to have their picture taken after we finish this session, uh, over there, or over there. But in the meantime, we have resolutions that they want to bring on us. So I, I will call out the folks who won either for resident World Council members or alumni World Council members. And then I'm in hopes that the World Council will kind of take over and work us through the various resolutions. And Tim Ring is here to do that. But before we get to Tim, let me call up uh, the winner of the alumni World Council, Seth Dewey.
Okay. The alternate member for the alumni, the, the alumni member, by the way, it's a three-year term. The alternate is for one year, and that alternate is Roger Gary. Come on up. Roger, you're an alternate. Come on up here. Okay, now this then gets us to the resident members. And you'll recall that you voted for four resident members, and one of the resident members you voted for was for the two-year term. And so let's have her up first, Gabriel Davis. Now, the three-year terms of resident members, there are three resident members that were elected, David Jenkins of Texas, Travis Young. <laughs> Travis Young of Louisiana. and Kay Stevens of Oklahoma. Okay, now all these, all these member folks are up here, the uh, resident members, the resident member and the alumni. And now we have two resident alternatives or alternates, and let me call them up, Stephanie Smith, Virginia. And Bruce Stedge, North Carolina. I should also add that uh, everybody should give a hand to Jane Malloy and, and uh, Ken Hoffman, who counted those ballots. Now, also, while we're getting up here on the stage, why don't the ex members of the existing World Council come up here, too? me mentioned many times before how important the whole World Council is to our operation. They truly are the canary in the coal mine. They truly are the folks that reach out there and let us know how we can do a better job. And I'm sure that this newly constituted World Council will be able to enjoy getting expertise from former members like Myrna Brown and James McLean and Tim Ring will start giving him some good information because, and Sherry does that too, the reason we need that is that we are growing and as we grow, we need to make these procedural changes to make sure that we keep the quality that we have worked so hard to gain. Now, Tim, what do you want to do next? Do you want to can, can you move over there so Jane can get your picture? Everybody. And, and then while that's happening, we, I'll filibuster a little bit. I'll give you some bullshit. But in addition to that, I will work in there the fact that... Uh, I think every comment I've heard from visitors we've had to this convention is so much praise for each of you. 
Monsignor Tolentino, you know, said that after he came in and met folks, he said, I wish my church was this way. And I said, what the hell do you mean? <laughs> and he says, everybody is so friendly. Everybody's loving each other. You can feel love in the air. Right. Of course, I had to mention to him, if you'd cut your sermons a little shorter, you might have that same feeling <laughs> at your church. But I think that that is part of this stuff we talk about of family. We truly are a family. And obviously, as we have grown, our family members are spread out wide, near, far away, from Alaska to Florida, Hawaii to Maine. But this annual event gives us a chance to get together. I know that many of your states have state conventions. Virginia has a state convention that almost follows the script of this convention. I think Paul Stevens quickly figured out that the way to build a convention is copy as much as you can from the national convention. And that's okay. North Carolina has a convention. Oklahoma has a convention. Texas has had a number of get-togethers across the state. I hope that all states begin to have the kind of meeting that we have at the national level so that friendships become stronger, so that we have greater opportunity to share our strength, experience, and hope. And so we can also kind of goose each other about are we doing enough to open new houses? Opening new houses is not just a numbers game. Opening new houses is something that those in the 12-step fellowship programs recognize as 12th step. Having had a spiritual awakening, we have the responsibility to carry this to the still suffering alcoholic and drug addict. And there are lots lots of alcoholics and drug addicts still out there. And for most of those alcoholics and drug addicts out there, we know that in our lives, living in an Oxford house made a big difference. As the hands were raised at various parts of this convention as to how many have done jail time, almost every hand went up. You can turn on the nightly news at any one of the cable networks or the ordinary news networks and hear all kinds of weeping and gnashing of teeth about how many folks are incarcerated in America and how terrible that is. If you had a chance to talk to those folks and ask the commentators the most important question, you would say, what happens to people who are incarcerated when they get out? What happens when people get out? There are darn few folks out there that pay much attention to that. I'm thinking that Oxford House may be the organization that pays most attention to that. You've heard Curtis Taylor, you've heard others, you've heard, used to hear the late Tony Perkins in the state of Washington. We heard many of these individuals who talked about reaching back into prison where they had been, extending a hand out to the local jail and to the prison to say, if you got a booze or a drug problem, think about Oxford House, you might want to apply. And if you're in a house, we're willing to reach out in all kinds of imaginative ways that old fart folks like Paul Malloy don't understand. <laughs> but they tell me they've got stuff that can look at your computer and you can look at the other person and you can see each other. <laughs> it's called FaceTime and what the hell are the other ones? I'm asking two old guys up here that don't know much more than I do. <laughs> but 
Those kinds of things we use, and we use it with great skill, because in our large family of 23,000 folks at any given time, there are folks like Tim Deal, for example, who dreamed up that wonderful vacancy system we have. You know, I don't text, Jane doesn't text, but I know that people in the houses text, whatever the hell that is. <laughs> and I know that automatically a cell phone within that house gets a text each week saying, how many vacancies you got? Yeah. Yeah. And then a little while after your regular meeting, that same phone gets a text, did you fill the damn vacancy? And if you go on OxfordVacancies.com on that internet stuff, you can see when the last call was made and whether or not there's a vacancy. Wow. That's pretty fancy. As he say out there in the Midwest, everything's up to date in Kansas City. Is it Kansas City or Oklahoma? Where the hell is everything up to date? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, those kinds of things are things that come about as we get to know each other more, as we work more, and as we work to expand this wonderful network of houses. The World Council has spent a lot of time and a lot of work during the year, conference calls every two weeks and a sabbatical out in Arkansas, to figure out what kinds of resolutions they should add to, to guide us in their future. In your little bags that you got, you noticed you got an updated version of the house manual, of the chapter manual, of the state association manual, and of the world council manual. And you probably noticed in that world council manual that there are three or four pages now of resolutions passed at each of these conventions. The fact that you read those from the beginning to end will tell you that we will have had second thoughts on a number of things. For example, you know, resolution three, I think it was, said nobody in methadone shall ever live in an Oxford house. Maybe, rep, you know, resolution 23 had something along the same line. And then somewhere, four or five years ago, came another resolution saying, we repeal those resolutions, and now it's up to each house. And we put the faith back where it's always been that the inmates can run the asylum on a house-by-house -house basis. <laughs> so I'm going to turn this uh, session over to Tim. and. Uh, He's going to call upon folks from the World Council to read the resolutions, and you all are to vote on them. I usually sit around and count the votes, but I'm trusting that Tim has learned how to count since he got clean and sober <laughs> and been on the World Council. And so he will do that, and we will see you all tonight at the banquet. Look forward to it. Hey everybody, my name is Tim. I'm an alcoholic, a person in long-term recovery. Haven't had a drink or a drug since September 13th of 2010. For that, I'm truly grateful. Uh, well, I didn't expect to be turned over the reins, but cool. Um, so I'm gonna give a little spiel about the resolutions, why we need them, what work we do to get them put together for you to make Oxford House better. So, like Paul said, all the previous resolutions voted on at the World Conventions are in the back of the World Council Manual in your information bag. It gives you a good history of the issues that have come, that have arisen from all these conventions past that you see on the walls over here till today. And so you got to think that these, the ideas that we collect from our shared experience are put into these resolutions for you to vote on. There's a microphone right here in the middle if you have discussion. It's, it's very similar to, to passing a motion in your house meeting. We, we will present the resolution. Somebody will make a motion. 
It'll be seconded, and then we'll take a vote. Or will there be discussion? That's when you can use the microphone, and then there will be a vote. Um, so let's get to it. We, we've come up with four resolutions that got through um, Paul's okay, Paul and Jane's okay. And um, we had several more, so we'll, we'll, we've got some left over for next year. Um, so J. Rob is um, Jeffrey Robert Henderson, um, short for J. or J. Rob for short is is finishing his sixth year on the World Council, and uh, he's been he's been our standards chair for the past six years, right? I think. Standards. Yeah, standards committee chairman. So that the task of the standards committee chairman is to put these resolutions together after we've come up. So he's going to come up and read one at a time. And then we'll, somebody can make a motion and second, and, and we'll have discussion and see if they pass. They never get my name right. My name's Robert Henderson, and I'm a person in long-term recovery, which means I haven't had a drink or drug since February 6, 2008. Uh, the reason for this first one is they, this has been going on and on and on, and uh, they need to mop this up, man. It's a one-time deal, uh, okay? So uh, let me read this. Be it resolved that any Oxford house in operation and good standings for at least three years prior to the 2019 World Convention should be issued a permanent charter. Discussion? Questions. Yeah, please step up to the microphone in the middle come, aisle here. Come West Shore. Any Hello? My name is Wes. I'm from Oxford House Chiming in Newcastle, Delaware. Hey, Les. Um, I do not support the resolution because the process is really very simple and straightforward for a house to apply for a permanent charter. Um, I've moved into houses with a temporary charter for a number of years, filled out the paperwork, and had turnaround in just a matter of weeks from the folks in Silver Spring. So um, the process is really very simple. Um, Amnesty, I've seen fail in many ways, in many different places. Um, amnesty doesn't even work at the library for fines. Uh, we've had amnesty for folks who have been in arrears on chapter dues, and it works for a very short period of time, and then the problem comes up again. So I just caution everyone to beware of, um, you know, offering blank and amnesty for something that's very simple and takes very little time and has a turnaround to benefit the house. Appreciate that. For just a point of clarity, this is a, uh, is is this resolution was proposed to relieve the pressure on OHI for to get catch up. It's not for all the new houses, it's just for the houses that have been backlogged for and in good standing for three years that haven't been able to get it in. So it's not like it's gonna, it's not gonna repeat after that unless we need to make another resolution. Um, so this is a, a point, it's, it's been produced to relieve the strain on the pressure of getting everybody caught up. So, but thank you for your input, sir. We're going to give you one minute because we, we, we've got to keep this moving. Sure. I think you might have answered my question anyway. I was just wondering, does that mean that, like, um, a charter can't be revoked? Is that what they're talking no. about? No. We're, we're, it says uh, that any Oxford house in operation and in good standing for at least three years prior to this convention uh, should be issued a permanent charter in order to relieve the stress of the system that's backlogged right now. I see. Once we get a clean slate... The, the process will be so much easier, 
you know, we're, we've improved so much that Paul just described the history that we've been improving, but there's been a backlog of paperwork and, and trying to get things uh, solved. Travis? Yeah. Try also, on that, the charter, a permanent charter has the same three conditions. House must be democratically run following the Oxford House manual. Number two, financially self-supporting. Number three, must kick out anybody who relapses. Mm -hmm. And so even if you've been around for 20 years and have a permanent charter, unless you follow those three conditions, goodbye. Yeah. We're just talking about issues, not pulling anything. I'm Travis. Travis Oxford House Bond Pair, Alexandria, Louisiana. Um, this resolution, a lot of people don't really understand. We have the conditional charters, and they're only valid for six months. So we'll have houses that'll get started. They'll they'll be conditionally chartered for six months, and then they're no longer chartered. And if they don't get around to doing that permanent charter, either because of turnover in the house, or because um, outreach didn't get a chance to go help them, or whatever happens. They're no longer Oxford houses. The name on that lease is Oxford House, not those residents, right? So their leases aren't even valid if they don't have a valid Oxford charter. Additionally, our legal teams can't represent them if they run into some civil, civil rights violations, okay? And I understand uh, what the gentleman said before me about, yes, we're enabling them, and, and I don't entirely disagree with it, but ultimately, we have to protect our residents and we have to protect our houses. Amen. And in order to do that, we have to have charters. Rightly so. Travis. Jeff Ross, Dockford House, Forest, uh, Fairchester Woods, Virginia. Yeah. Uh, I just have an issue with the verbiage. It says uh, they should be chartered. Instead of, you know, blankets usually just go ahead and give it blanketly to everybody Are from that criteria. And if the, the, the verbiage of should means that there's going to be other criteria that's going to be looked at before each house gets their uh, charter. Okay. So would you want to make a motion to amend that to? Will. With, will be. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to change the verbiage from should to will. Okay. We'll, we'll go back to discussion. Sean? My name is Deshaun Smith, uh, Houston, Texas. Um, so, yeah, I support that because it's irritating to have to get that done for a lot of houses, I'm just going to be honest, uh, the paperwork. I do want to voice the concern that I have because while we want to protect our houses, the inability to get it done, I've seen some houses that have not that paperwork proves that you're doing the three things, right? So by having to take pictures of having house meetings and, and whatnot, it shows that you're actually operating the way you should. And unfortunately, I've experienced houses that are not doing that. And so to just blanketly give them that, I just want to point that out so that that can at least be addressed. But I do uh, support and second the motion and would like to vote for it. Call the vote? Yes. We call the vote. All right. As amended. As amended. As amended. Correct. All in favor, raise your hands. Raise your hands. Let us keep them up for a minute. We're going to get a really accurate account, Paul. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Oh, easily. 230. Four. Anybody opposed? Raise your hands. One, Paul Stevens. No. <laughs> One, two. Four opposed. Motion passes as amended. This is the next one. Go right on this one. Resolution number two. Be it resolved that in accordance with Oxford House. Democratic principles, House business meetings should be scheduled to accommodate all residents. Motion made, second made. Any discussion, come up to the microphone. No discussion. All in favor, raise your hands. My name is AJ from Washington State. 
Hey. So basically, what, basically what I'm hearing is that the house meeting has to accommodate all people in the house. Hey, so if you have a vacancy, and if someone is trying to get into that house, and they ask them their schedule, and that schedule that they have that they are doing for the recovery and their work does not meet that the house meeting that they have, they don't get voted in just because their schedule doesn't fit in with the house. Is that, is that how I understand this? You put the carriage for the horse and read it. Yeah. Hey, let, me, let me reread this for you. Be it resolved that in accordance with Oxford House Democratic principles, house business meetings should be scheduled to accommodate all residents. In my house, we've been known to change the meeting times four times in a month because people's schedules change, and we need you there because we all want your input. Right. Okay. Well, and again, I think you were thinking of interviews, not business house meetings. Um, so it has been motioned and seconded. We are in discussion. If you don't, like if someone's interviewing, but their business meeting is on a certain day, and their house is trying to get somebody new in, but that person that they're interviewing is scheduled does not meet up with the business meeting that the house has. Then the not house is changing. Let me. That's okay. Let me. Let me clarify. Well, let's let one person talk at a time. Go ahead, Travis. Okay. So to clarify for this gentleman and for anybody else, there's three types of meetings. There's business meetings. There's emergency meetings and there's interviews, which are, not, you, you don't have to interview during your house meeting. I've heard that said from houses no, before. Everybody. Please interview people anytime and any way that you can. Yeah. By phone. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> what we're speaking about, and perhaps we should put some clarification in, in, the, uh, in the resolution, is that we're speaking of your weekly business meeting. Okay. Uh, house business meeting. Business. Does it say business? Yes. Business. Okay, so it does. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. The other stuff, please do those as needed. If you have a, a, an eviction to, to handle, handle that when it needs to be handled, an interview, what have you. What we want people to appreciate because some bad information has been put out to houses was that if our house meeting is at 6 o'clock on Sunday, that's when our house meeting is. And if you can't make it, then you just don't get a vote. That is not democracy. Right. Not in the slightest. Right. right. So... so Anyway, we just simply wanted to correct that information to the body at large and let you guys know, and so that y'all can disseminate that back to your home areas, that please stop doing that. Please accommodate them as best as possible. It's not always possible to get everybody there, but do what you can. Move the meeting around, help people make the meetings, especially newcomers. That's right. Try, and uh, for clarification, uh, we, we, this, these resolutions come mm. about because we've noticed an issue that many of the house members don't attend their own business meetings. So, and this is not a forced upon, you, you don't ha your house is a democracy, ultimately. This is just a best practice resolution that you get you to think about, do all our house members go to our business meetings? Yeah. Why They're don't better. they? Do, are we willing to move around a little bit so everybody has their vote? At, if you don't know how much money's in the bank account at the treasurer's report, are you a house member? No. So are we doing our best to accommodate all the house members to be at the regular weekly house business meetings? Yeah, go ahead. John Reardon, Washington State, voting alumni number three, okay. chapter one. Hey, John. Chapter one for a reason. Um, my only concern, and this is not really for or against, but um, when new people come into the house and they start to get a life and things get better and they get through their, all their IOP, and then they go out into the workforce, and all of a sudden they're applying for a job that conflicts with the current house meeting. Okay, my only concern is then does the whole house have to adjust to that? Yes. You know yes. what I mean? For that one person who knew in advance before they took the job that the house meeting was at that time. Well, again, what you signed up for? Well, again, it's not going to be a blanket 100%. It's, it's a resolution to think about what I just said prior to, to, but that's true too. I mean, you want to discuss with your house when you're getting a job, what time, he's not even, he's not listening, so I'm gonna quit talking. Okay. Thank you. Next. Okay, so uh, Raquel Austin, Texas. Um, so people like, just putting it out there, like these aren't mandatory things. These are suggestions that are being put out there 
for houses to be open-minded and take this in and see that this actually might work. You know, when people are not present in their house meetings, they are not present in their houses. When people are not present in their houses, relapses happen, overdoses happen, out of charter things happen. So if there is some like, you know, it, it's not like when a newcomer comes in or like, oh, he can't be at this house meeting, we're not gonna take him. If that's what you're looking at when you're interviewing at somebody, like, you're not looking at the willingness and like, them wanting to stay sober and them wanting to be a part of this, like, like let's look at the bigger picture of that. It's not the only requirement. But like, we gotta promote being present in our houses. One of our principles is like recovery and like replication, like, you know, so like, that's what it really is, is for houses to make that a priority. So I just wanted to clarify that in case there was confusion on that. Thank you. Yeah. And we got two, two more uh, discussions. We got to keep this moving. Uh, my name is Dreema. I'm Virginia Chapter 5. Um, part of recovery is being responsible. When I go to a job interview, I tell them that I cannot work on Wednesdays because I have a prior engagement. When we interview people in our house, we tell them that Wednesdays is our house meeting. Is there going to be an issue with that, with you coming to that house meeting? And that is part of life. That is part of recovery. That is part of being a responsible member of society. And you can also tell your house members, if you know you can't make it to the next house meeting, you can tell your house members at the meeting a week before and say, hey, I don't think I can come next Wednesday. We have people who switch around their IOP just to make it to our house meetings. But they're told in the interview, and we tell all of them to tell their jobs. You're allowed two days off a week. So to do that is a complete, com I like to know that I have one day that I have to do something completely this for my house. I know the first Thursday of every month, I have a chapter meeting. And I know that I have to take that off from work every month. Well, you shouldn't have Thanks. to. You shouldn't have to. J-Rob. J-Rob. Hi. Hi, family. My name's Teal. I'm from San Antonio, Texas. And I just wanted to ask the body to be open-minded because a lot of people coming into Oxford House are coming in from jails or reentry people and, you know, convicted felons. And we don't always have the most wide variety of choices of where we can get employment. And so maybe we should be open-minded and consider that when we're uh, addressing the house meeting schedule. Go ahead, Adam. Adam's going to speak for one second, and we'll get your. I'd like to call previous question at this time. Okay. Yeah, it's been moved to vote. Do you have a quick? I just have a really quick amendment I'd like to uh, make a motion for. Sure. To be a little more specific, to have it like employment related, because. A lot of people can't get a job, and some people just don't want to have it because they just that's their only day off, things like that. So I was just want to make an, a motion or amendment to uh, make that more specific to employment. Make a motion to uh, it, it's a house issue when you're, what time your meeting is, what day it is, and you can change it once a week if you need to. Uh, the whole thing here is we want you to accommodate all members. Uh, since I've been in recovery, it's not all about me. And... Uh, our house meeting is 10 o'clock, god awful, and it's during a football game, and we will change it for this and that. But if you're not at work in the hospital or at a world convention, you better be at the meeting tonight. Um, excuse me. That's, that's amazing, but I'm pretty sure I heard a motion, and yeah. the chair needs to call for a second that, or not. That's right. Thanks. Seconded and discussion. Uh, we're going to go ahead and vote. Well, which, which, which one are we voting for? Um, the, mo the amendment was not seconded. You want, yeah, so the resolution has been motion seconded. Discussion is had. All in favor? Aye. Any? Go count. Keep your hands up. Two hundred twenty. What do you think, Adam? About, I'd say about 200. 200, yay. All those opposed, raise your hands and hold them up. I got two hands over here from one guy. No, that's two people. Never mind. I got about ten. Ten nays. Motion passes. All right. All right, number three, moving right along. 
One of the big issues this year at the World Council Summit was was the issue of theft. So we came up with a few resolutions and the board of directors give us the nod, and so did Paul. And here we go. Be it resolved that in, court, in accordance with Tradition 6, all Oxford House entities with bank accounts should provide monthly audits at regular business meetings to deter theft. Are you against that? Are you against that? Motion made, seconded. Discussion? No, I, just got, I have an amendment. Instead of should I amend it to be will. Hey, cool. Second. We got amendment. Motion to, to amend the resolution to put sh will instead of should. And seconded. So the reason the reason it was worded as should specifically, we looked at that, is because these are best practices. These are not requirements. These are not black and white. Okay, like this is something that your chapter and your your regional associations are going to have to determine by your bylaws. We're just trying to spread best practices. There are there are states and areas that don't have state associations, outreach workers, things like that, that go by these and that need to know some of the stuff that we already know. Hence the reason we're doing this. We look at it from the whole country, the whole world perspective, not just your regional association. So we've noticed this countrywide, and we need to address it countrywide or worldwide. Does that make sense? We appreciate the passion that you have for the way you've done things. And if it works keep doing it. But there are, there are areas out there that we have to think about and reach as a world council that don't have any support, you know, or have very little. And these resolutions in the back just kind of give them a hint of, of what we see that they may not be getting anything of. So the verbiage that we, we know how we don't like to be ordered to do things. Like we are not ordering you to do these practices that we have here. But when we use the words like should, they seem more like suggestions that, that work. You know, they've worked before. So that's why we use the verbiage should in, in a lot of these. But some of them need to be wills. We understand that. But we don't want to get, get you guys riled up. You're well, telling me what to do, boy, you know, and all that stuff. <laughs> How dare you? But, but these, these practices need to be done. So um, do you want to keep your motion to amend the will? Because it's been seconded instead of the should or okay well you want the original to shoot to be should so you need to mo make a motion to rescind the change to will okay and and move to keep it the way it was all right do you so want it that way or not and you want will okay he's standing firm on his Okay. Original he, motion. He, yeah, okay. He's the only one that can rescind it. No, the seconder. Well, the seconder can rescind their second, but. Who, who, who seconded the original? And you don't rescind it. I'd like to make an amendment to the main motion. It's up to you, man. It don't matter. It's going to a vote. Yeah, if it doesn't pass, so if the you want we'll we'll to stick to it, stick to it, dude. It's up to you. If you feel that way, we can move. If you feel it should be a will, then stick by it, and we'll take it to a vote. Yeah. Okay. That's the democratic process, right? It's been motioned and seconded, so we'll go ahead and vote on, uh, let's just read it again, that in accordance with the Tradition 6, all Oxford House entities with bank accounts will provide monthly audits at regular business meetings to deter theft. It's been seconded. All in favor, raise your hands. And keep them up. Keep this is going to be a more accurate count. Yeah, it, it will be. Motion failed. I don't know who. There's one more popped up in the back. 
If you want it to say will, have your hand down. If you want it to say should, put your hand down. If you wanted to say will instead of should, keep your hands up. So we got 76. We got 76 for. 76 for all opposed. Yes. Shut it down my throat. Tell me, I'll tell me. Put two of them. <laughs> I've got well over 50 right here. All right, so motion fails. Motion fails. So it's going to should? Yeah. Final, final count was um, okay. se 76 for and 110 against. Okay. So let's, let's do the original motion. There's been a motion made to accept the original wording. There's been a second. More discussion? Yes, sir. Oh, it's been moved to vote. Moved to vote. There is a gentleman standing at the mic. I see that. Discussion. But, so do all Oxford houses have bank accounts? Yes. yes. I hope so. Okay. If you're using a cash system, there's bigger problems. That, that's correct. But again, that's correct. But the verbiage in there says houses with bank accounts. So if for some reason a house entities. did not... Entities. In, entities. Like, but if some reason... if one of our entities did not have a bank account, so they're not gonna get audited. We don't worry about cash. They they were, yeah, all Oxford houses open up with a bank account. The idea is that anything with a bank account needs to do audits, and we all have bank accounts. Okay. It's a, it's a valid, okay, move to vote. All in favor of said resolution? Keep your hands up. <laughs> 210 for, all opposed. Raise your hand, hold them up. Put your hand down. One opposed in the back. Okay, motion passes. Democracy at its best. All right. Okie dokie. Here comes the last, but not the least. And I certainly hope it's worded correctly. <laughs> Woo. Be it resolved that houses and chapters be encouraged to do financial security trainings twice, that's two times, per year. Motion made and seconded. Discussion? No discussion. Come on, get up there. Come on, man. There we go. Everybody should be doing that anyway. Right. We ain't got to discuss that. Thing. That stuff has been, it's in your manual. And all the, all the world council is doing is saying, hey, we want everybody on the same page. Call the vote. All in favor, raise your hands. All, uh, uh, yeah, count. Kevin, you ain't voting. <laughs> I can't vote. I'm chairman. <laughs> Is anybody counting? From here, it looks about 210 again. 200, 200, 212. All those opposed? I just had to get a different view on it. No opposed. 212. To zero, motion passes. Thank you guys, and if you have any other input on best practices, please talk to us. Have a good night, see you at the banquet.